from beautiful East Tennessee in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains, you're listening to the Sherry Voluntary Show, and I do appreciate you spending your time with me. My guest today is someone who may actually be in the running for the title of nicest person around, and that oh. is <laughs> Mr. Ford Fisher, and he is, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work, he's a board member on media consultant at the G3 Group. Um, National Advisor at Solutions Institute and Editor-in-Chief at News to Share. And uh, welcome to the show, uh, Ford. It's really great to talk to you again. Yeah, thank you for uh, having me on here. Yeah. And that was a that was a very sweet intro. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, you you are, I think everyone who, who knows you, that's, that definitely is your reputation as um, you're a very honest journalist and just an all-around good guy. So, um you're probably too good for a lot of us here in the, in the, the Liberty Movement. <laughs> so um, recently, you've been all over the place and in the news, and um, you got demonetized by YouTube, but not deplatformed. Is that correct? Well, they they removed two specific videos uh, outright. So two two specific videos are totally inaccessible to people. And then six minutes after they did that, they demonetized the whole channel. So now... Uh, you know, of course, the things I film range are are all sorts of things. So they range from things that would probably be considered disturbing, uh, violent, and so forth, but always newsworthy, uh, to things that are totally, uh, you know, mundane. I filmed Nancy Pelosi give you know speeches, and I can't think of anything more uh, dare I say boring. Um, <laughs> Right. So they so they've demonetized the entire channel rather than before, where based on keywords and such, they would sort of demonetize uh, certain videos, but leave monetized other videos. Sure. I, now I when I was reading uh, one of the articles that was written about what has happened to you in this whole YouTube's latest purge, uh, one mm -hmm. of the things is that. In the, it looked like to me in the in the announcement or the email they sent you about the demonetization, it seems to insinuate that an actual person reviewed this yep. information. But I think any person watching your channel would certainly see that it's just footage. Like it, you don't offer political commentary. You're not saying that this side is right or this side is wrong. Generally, it's just. It's for information. It's it, you're trying to be a balanced, an actually fair and balanced journalist, right? And it's for the sake of other people to do the analysis. This is the thing that I've been pointing out, and it's the thing that YouTube seems basically incapable of understanding. I'm not filming things because I want uh, people to just sort of rely on my channel to establish their worldview, right? I'm I'm covering street activism, and that's not what the entire world is about. What, what I'm doing is sort of documenting uh, a story arc, so to speak, of, of America in this current political moment. Uh, how did we get here? Where are we? And what direction are we, are we going? And so when I, when I film this stuff, it is with the understanding that I don't have to, I, the journalist, I, the cameraman, don't have to tell you what to think of the thing, but other people can, right? I enjoy seeing... Uh, uh, other outlets write about my work and embed my videos. And sometimes they have opinions about the videos that I'd personally agree with. And sometimes I have a, they have opinions about the videos that I personally disagree with. And that is sort of the, um, in my in my mind, that's that's kind of the purpose of news as opposed to opinion journalism. The, the reason that I, <laughs> the thing that I don't like is you go on to CNN and they stick uh, one of their reporters between two opinion people. So it'll it'll be like Anderson Cooper, and then he'll be like, and we have on the right Rick Santorum, and on the left <laughs> we have this random person who worked for Hillary Clinton at some point. <laughs> and we are going to talk about some subject, and everybody knows that it, you know if the media just tells you what to think, then that's bad. But if they give you two possible things you could think, ah, uh, now we're now we're in objective journalism. Right. I disagree. I, I think that just giving people two possible opinions is, uh, first of all, exacerbating the left-right divide. Um, it is exacerbating a paradigm that I'm not even sure I entirely agree with, which is the left-right divide in the first place. But but one way or another, I think it's pretty clear that the mainstream media profits from uh, that that belief that there's only sort of two options and you have to choose one or the other. What I say is I am not proclaiming neutrality as many of these mainstream media journalists do, right? So when Anderson Cooper sticks himself in between Rick Santorum and then some random person and says, I've got the two sides here, 
you know, he's sort of he's almost making a claim of the of the neutrality or the right. equivalence between those two sides. I make no such claim. I'm going out there to film everything to get everyone on the record. What are you doing? Why are you out here? Why are you using these tactics? What are what are the tactics? And, uh, you know, if violence occurs, then we see it. And if violence doesn't occur, we can kind of see why it didn't. Mm. And so those I think that you kind of have to start with the truth first to understand uh, a situation. I, I think that's a, a really a big part of why people respect you and your work so much is I just recently saw where you had posted um, at the uh, Pride Parade in D.C. Mm -hmm. and there was an arrest and you said on there, one cameraman from one angle does not the whole story make, basically, and that that yes. you can't that these are they, these are all pieces of information, and that we as consumers of that information need to try and get more than one story of that information. So right. I would love to have a hundred of me running around at like every different situation. And this is part of the problem, right? I came on. So I'll give I'll flesh out that situation better, actually, because I I was right to say I don't know exactly what happened. So uh, what occurred on Saturday was there was a pride march and the pride march ended suddenly when there was report of reports of an active shooter and people uh did in fact run like run away screaming jumping over barricades people got severely hurt um and by the way i wasn't there at that exact moment when that happened i saw reports of this and i headed to the scene it took about 20 minutes for me to get there so I, i'm getting there you know 20 minutes after the was it a shooting was ben. it whatever somehow <laughs> it led to this this sort of stampede and so i walked around trying to ask people what happened some people were saying were claiming that they heard gunshots uh which which turned out not to be true um, at, but what people basically agreed on was that people were screaming shooter, shooter, gun, gun, that kind of thing and ran away. I, uh, arrive in DuPont circle and I see a, uh, person, uh, sitting in handcuffs and, uh, the police are around this person, uh, questioning them at the time I was using gender neutral pronouns. I didn't know, do they identify as a man or a woman or something? But now, now I know that, that this person identifies as a woman. So I'll call her, her, um, uh, in the context of a pride march, I'm especially sensitive to that sort of thing. Um, what it, and so throughout the evening, I, I wanted to follow. How are the police uh, treating this clearly agitated uh, apparent suspect of something? And um, they walked her over to this uh, sort of police cart that was pretty far away from the closest they'd let me be. But I sort of zoomed into it tight and I wanted to be able to see it. And indeed, I think it was important that I did that because she actually at one point started uh, like kicking. And they, uh, while she was handcuffed, they uh, put her back onto the ground, right? It's uh, not, it's very common for a suspect to be put onto the ground as they're being arrested in the first place. It's, it's fairly uncommon for a detained suspect to end up in a new physical altercation with the police officers. Um, so I filmed this whole thing. And the thing that I was clear about to the people, I, you know, I'm explaining, this is what I'm seeing. There's a person who's kicking at the police and blah, blah, blah. Eventually she was taken away in a police van. But I was very clear. I don't know if this is the suspect. For all I know, this is someone who was detained for having uh, marijuana, right? I I have no idea. I'm, I'm showing you this is a thing that I'm seeing at a place where this is what was being reported. What it turned out actually happened uh, is that two people were arrested and it took a lot longer to take her away. Um, it was a individual and his girlfriend, and it appears that she was the girlfriend, um, were at this pride event and someone said something that he felt uh, was offensive to her and he produced a BB gun and threatened someone with a BB gun that was realistic looking as a real firearm. People started running away uh, and apparently they over, hopping over barricades, you have loud crashing noises of things breaking, falling as the, sure. the barricades are falling. And that causes people to believe that they're gunshots, especially in the context of people screaming gun, gun and living in a city where people don't know what gunshots sound like. <laughs> right. And uh, so and it turns out that they arrested her not long after because in her it, as this was going on, she was getting mad at the police officers over doing this. And at some point they allege that she assaulted them in some way, which is quite consistent with the fact that later during her arrest, uh, she continued to behave basically in a manner consistent with that. So it does highlight this point, right? That, yeah, I don't do necessarily co like commentary uh, other than providing context or sort of this is what I know. I don't claim that my 
footage can provide a complete understanding of a situation. I showed up after the thing that happened. Other people have video of the stampeding. One reporter from ABC had a video of the guy being arrested. Uh, I don't think I've seen a single image of the fire or of the supposed firearm that turned out to be a BB gun. So I think there need to be more YouTubers like me, more live streamers like me, not less. And YouTube seems to be trying to make it impossible to do that. Yeah, I, there's so much there to unpack. Um, one thing is just to, a reminder that our minds can trick us, especially when we're afraid. I, I've, I've heard instances of, and this is pretty fairly common as, as far as I understand, that after an event that is scary for people, say a, a holdup at a convenience store or something, that people will often describe the suspect in very different ways. They can be a different race, different heights, different um, many, many different inconsistencies because people tend to, you know, they have a different point of view and, and fear does things to our brain. So I, I'm not surprised that people would hear gunshots, even if there maybe weren't any, because your mind can interpret things in a certain way, depending on your context and, and in a heightened situation mm -hmm. like that, that can certainly be true. Um, the other thing is the, the whole left, right paradigm that you mentioned. I, I think it's, it's so true, even in say, national politics. We get, you know, we, we see one uh, person who's el elected uh, or, or has power in a country, and we call that a dictatorship and think it's so bad, but we think because we have two choices, oh, freedom, right? And, and really, that is what they set up for us on the media. If you, if you watch that, they automatically say the left and right are both equal in their opinions, and there is only a left and right and you can't, you know, that I think more people fall all over the place than strictly in whatever they consider left or right. And so there's sort of this false paradigm. I think you're, you're correct about that. Right. I, so because I film activism, which are the people who are so passionate about their causes that they go out onto the street to talk about them, yeah. uh, I have filmed a whole lot more people with a kind of widening the Overton window is what we call that, right? The the range of what is considered acceptable opinion. I've I've it filmed all kinds of people. And, and again, it doesn't mean that I'm considering their opinions to be more or less legitimate as a result of filming them. But in documenting them, I've realized how narrow the Republicans and Democrats are. As people get politically further away uh, from those two political parties, they tend to be in agreement that those two political parties aren't that different on the world stage. I have filmed uh, communists uh, make that claim. I have filmed fascists make that claim. And I very frequently hear anarchists and libertarians make that claim. Um, <laughs> That, that fundamentally Republicans and Democrats in the opinion of, I guess you could say, most radical ideologies, most ideologies in one direction or another, and they might have different ways of describing it, but basically the Republican and Democrat, De Republican and Democratic Party both more or less are, are hawkish, pro-war, neoliberal capitalist parties, yeah. right? That's more, right, so you, some people might criticize, well, but you know, the, the Democrats are slightly a little bit into socialism or the Republicans are slightly a little bit into, uh, you know, what, like socialism. whatever else, <laughs> but also socialism. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, you know, so, so people might have different ways that they approach it, but in the grand scheme of kind of the different ranges of political thought that exist on, on planet earth, um, the Republicans and Democrats are, are pretty similar, uh, to one another. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it comes down to the, I, I tell my friend, um, Grant Henry, who I was uh, appearing on his show once a week, uh, that he, he keeps telling me that the, the parties are getting further apart. And I, not really. When you look at it, not really, because when it comes down to the major, the two main things is that they all want to force you to do the things that they want. And they all want you to like it and agree with it and go along with it and play into their system. So I think that people with radical ideologies um, I, I have seen that growing, I, and I think part of the reason that people like myself get more traction is because people are fed up with being told that these people represent your interests when they clearly do not. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I think that's that's been a great boon for um, people to think outside the box. I will say that on, on the idea of, oh, the parties are getting further apart from each other, because um, it's something I hear a lot. I think that there's a difference between ideological and kind of moral division and then like actual policy. Um, so like if you, you know, the, the part, the party platforms of the Democratic and Republican parties haven't really changed so, so much of late. Right. Uh, I would say that probably the biggest uh, change in the Democratic Party's platform 
recently was the uh, they now favor the abolition of the death penalty. Right. Which is something that probably probably most libertarians would actually yeah. agree with. Um, you know, but but generally speaking, the it's not so much that the policies are so different. It's that they've become it's that they've fed into the idea that they are so drastically different that they stop talking to each other. Right. So and it and it ends up also being over these matters of politics that aren't really related to political ideology. Right. The Mueller report, for example, people can apply their political principles to it uh, for sure. Right. I mean, there are issues of, you know, Trump says that he's uh, sort of nationalist or that he favors national sovereignty. But someone could point at it and say, but, you know, this shows that some foreign country got involved. Right. So people can apply their different political philosophies one way or another. But the Mueller report is not a political document in the sense sure. that it's a leftist or a rightist document. Um, and to that same end, when Donald Trump says, I'm not going to work with the Democrats on anything because of the Mueller report, is that a result of exacerbated political tension or actual differences of political opinion? I would certainly say the former. Uh, the other thing I'd point out is, uh, you know, we didn't have uh, Antifa running around really in America. And so this is sort of a phenomenon that basically started on the onset of the Trump era. And we didn't really have what you might call like pro Mitt Romney or pro uh, uh, John McCain like street gangs, right? So I, I'm not <laughs> personally calling, um, for example, these organizations gangs, but uh, you have the prosecution of the Proud Boys in New York, which uh, they their whole thing is that they call themselves a pro Western civilization drinking club, but they, they get into physical altercations uh, with people on the streets and they're decidedly pro Trump. Right. Um, they, uh, that organization is being prosecuted and be as a gang in New York. They're being classified as a gang. So how did we get into this political moment where people are engaging in political street violence against each other? Yeah. Clearly, the country is not more united. So clearly, there's something to the idea that there's more divisiveness. I just don't think that it's a result of actual political ideology. It's more about language. Yeah. And I think it's a lot about force. People have resentments that build up over time because they've been forced or they feel forced or they see people being forced in a way that they think is unfair to do certain things. And so then they want to use that same proxy force of the, the government on other people and create resentments with them. And so it's, I think it's just sort of coming to a head, it seems to, to be. Um, and uh, one of the, the things that you mentioned, it, it brought up in my mind, um, is going back to the media in general uh, and the, the tension between people. I, I remember seeing Ben Shapiro who I, I'm not a fan of, um, clearly, mm -hmm. who knows my work, would know that. But he was on the the BBC, I can't remember the gentleman's name, the actual... Oh, uh, yes, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes, and he, he seemed to actually be trying to be a reporter, a, a journalist, just uh -huh. kind of, you know, playing devil's advocate with him a little bit and, and asking him to... Uh, I, I, what I thought was a completely fair question uh, by saying, look, you, you're in your new book, you're calling for people to tone down the rhetoric because the rhetoric is a problem. It's, it's very um, awfulizing, if, you know, to use that word. But um, you in, don't actually do that yourself. And it seemed to me that he couldn't receive uh, any of those. Uh, there was also questions about uh, the abortion bans in Mississippi and things. And, and he, he automatically thought he was being attacked. And I thought mm -hmm. he's applying what, what seems to be the, the, if you're a conservative and you go on a liberal program, what they would consider a liberal program, you're going to be attacked. And if you're a liberal and go on a conservative front, you're going to be attacked. So you, they know they're getting set up. And I felt like he maybe thought this man was just trying to attack him, even though he wasn't because of the norm, it seems to be in mm -hmm. the media today. It's because of that reason that actually, so when I go out and interview people, I don't, uh, I don't do sort of confrontational interviews. I'm not trying to, uh, <laughs> slip people up. I don't try to, to, you know, whatever. And you know, what's funny is I do like to ask tough questions. I don't want to just be a, you know, I'm not going out there like, why are you so wonderful? Just tell me everything, right? Like, <laughs> I, I am trying to get at the heart of whatever it is, but I, and I ask things that I guess I'd consider difficult. But um, but sometimes I'll even say, I'm going to ask a, t a tough question here. And they'll say, you know, many people on the other side would say blah, blah, blah. So just as an example, I once filmed a civil disobedience protest uh, led by a group called Gays Against Guns. And it was an LGBT group that was protesting on the mostly based around like the Pulse nightclub shooting, right. saying, you know, we need to use gun control to protect LGBT folks. 
right? A question that I asked them is, um, given that you acknowledge that, uh, you know, LGBT folks are the, uh, are, are at a disproportionate risk of gun violence, um, are you not concerned as groups like the pink pistols are right? Many people, I would, I tend to say it like this. Many people on the other side of this say, you know, we need to extra arm LGBT folks, right? And, uh, aren't you concerned that exacerbating gun control might actually be disarming the people that you want to protect? Right. So I ask questions like that, that can be challenging or that lay out the other side. But because of this American political landscape where people don't understand that the, that that the journalist's job is not to have an opinion on it. And I have an opinion on that subject and people could right. probably guess it based on my political party. But I actually do not. Um, but but when I'm out there, I, all of that is not what I'm what I'm out there to do. And so people say that they're confused by my political ideology. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, a relatively high profile uh, conservative radio like guy was live. He was live streaming himself responding to a live stream of mine. And I found out after the fact <laughs> and I and I watched it back. It was I was filming in Dayton, Ohio, where the Ku Klux Klan came. There was only nine of them, but there were 600 leftists who came to counter demonstrate them. And a lot of them were really heavily armed. Right. And so I was talking to a lot of them. You know, why don't you uh, trust the police to protect you? Why do you feel uh, that it's important to sort of arm yourselves? Uh, you know, what do you say to I even worded it this way. What would you say to the white liberal mom who uh, tells you that, you know, this isn't the way to protect your community? Right. You know, so I was asking those sorts of questions and they're answering. And and uh, this <laughs> conservative uh, reporter was watching it and he goes, He's like Ford Fisher is teeming with dumb dumminess. These are he he goes he's like Ford Fisher is a leftist. I think he's a socialist or a communist of some kind. And I talked to him for about a half hour on the phone yesterday, or not yesterday, the following day. I managed to get him on the phone and sort of explain what I do. And by the end of it, he actually apologized. And when I tweeted about it, he ver he verified to the world that he apologized and that he was wrong. Um, that's how bad our mainstream right. media has gotten, that there is a working assumption that if you are talking to somebody, then you support them unless you are arguing with them, in which case you don't. And that there is no ability to just honestly go out there and try to record what's happening. Yeah, and I think that really goes to sort of the heart of the matter that um, many people like YouTube uh, as, a, as a company, but the people who run YouTube – um, would say that just talking to people is supporting what what they believe. Like like you can't have. They'll often say we have to come together and have this dialogue as if as if we could do that. Um, but uh, they don't actually want to talk to those people or uh, compete in the arena of ideas. Like what I see very often is a lot more. Um, like we had a, a recent event here in Knoxville where a man um, was speaking on campus. Uh, because they have a, a policy where they will rent out space and time to people to speak. Mm -hmm. and they don't they don't tell people what can and can't be on campus. And so uh, it was one guy and I, I don't know how many people ended up showing up, but it was a very small event. It was a white nationalist, of course. And and but the the other people who opposed him were in much greater number. And what they wanted the, to do was they wanted the university to stop them from even speaking, because there's sort of this. I feel like there's this uh, misophobia where people are so afraid of hatred that they don't counter it in the arena of ideas. When you have clearly the Ku Klux Klan, any of those white nationalist groups, they're not really the majority of people. I don't think we're living in, you know, 1940s, 50s era South uh, where there's a, a huge clan, all that. I mean, most of these people are very, very marginalized. They're not very wealthy. They don't have a lot of power. And so it seems like the, there's an overreaction to anyone that's outside of what uh, the mainstream would consider OK. I will. Uh, so I'm going to present the other point of view, not because I necessarily share it, but because <laughs> you've 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 effectively taken what I, I would say is the point of view that I hear most, I guess you could say, non-racist conservatives take. Right. Like. Um, like people saying, you know, these guys don't represent any reasonable part of America. It's wrong to be, you know, uh, reacting right. to them in a certain way, this or that. Not that so they're not dangerous. Here's, and not, and uh, not that they're not dangerous. Right. So I will, I will 
submit to you that this and this is not the and by the way, the point of view that you just said in the traditional sense is also the like the liberal point of view. Right. Um, so I'm going to just say that the, the th here's the thing that I hear leftists say. Sure. Right. When I go out to film them oppose these things, because I have filmed many times that leftists show up with guns to uh, and they say it's to protect their community. Um, they would say that uh, there are many of these groups that are kind of the tip of the iceberg who come out very ostensibly with the different uh, stuff, right? So so uh, last Saturday uh, in Detroit, at the Detroit Pride March, there was uh, the National Socialist Movement, you know, literal neo-Nazis, uh, showed up with swastikas, um, basically looking to uh, uh, get into a confrontation with those people and the police protected them. The most in, in the view of the leftists, most of the people who have those overt uh, racist, sexist, anti-gay, what have you, uh, beliefs, um, are actually not going to do it in that overt of a fashion. And this actually creates a, uh, weird gap that a few people have pointed out where, for example, I, if I'm reporting on literal neo-Nazis that I filmed donning swastikas, for example, and I put it onto YouTube, here's what these guys were doing. Here's how the police reacted. So, you know, all of that, uh, that documentation could be at risk on YouTube because it includes those overt, you know, sure. uh, symbols and Lang such. And, right. But to the person who actually has those ideas, to someone who believes in national socialism or is anti-Semitic or something, uh, they know what the rules are. And if they're going to start publishing on YouTube, they're going to actually dress it up in a way that they think is going to escape the rules. They might hide it behind criticisms of Israel. They might hide it behind certain tropes or stereotypes. And they're not likely to whip out, uh, you know, the extreme things that will very obviously get them banned. And this creates this weird situation where the Southern Poverty Law Center had a video taken down. Right. And they are a group that documents extremism. Literally, nobody thinks that the SPLC is trying to radicalize people into the ideologies that they're filming. But the SPLC has, in, for example, a section on its website on each profile. It says in their own words. It's actually the thing that I think is probably uh, you know, it's actually one of the, it's one of the only parts of the SPLC's thing that I, I really like the style of. They have this thing where at the top of a profile of these people, they, they just have quotations. The, like, this is what the person said. This is what the person said. This is what the person said. They're quotes. And they, and I believe they tend to cite where they found those quotes. Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of thing is in danger over big tech censorship, whereas and it's providing cover to the people who can just manipulate exactly how they talk about things in order to make it uh, consistent with the rules. Yeah, I, I think I, I, I understand that point of view. And it it, it, it just seems like there's a lot of um, labeling people like like my friend Michael Bolden of the Tenth Amendment Center was on the Southern Poverty Law Center's website as a person engaged in hateful speech because he, mm -hmm. he, you know, works on the 10th amendment and nullifying legislation. And, you know, I, they don't like something he said. He's, he's clearly not a racist. Um, anyone who knows him and follows his work would see that. Uh, and I, being a libertarian and saying libertarian things now is, is considered racist or having actual criticisms of Israel by many is called, you know, anti-Semitic. So how do we, how do we know the difference? How do we figure out how to filter through that then? I mean, I think the solution is to, is to just document and to be able to analyze and to be able to uh, criticize back and forth. So, I mean, an example would be uh, also on, I guess this was Friday, I went to an event called the Dyke March. And at the, it's a, it's a uh, pro LGBT uh, sort of prequel to Pride that happens, but it is considered to be a more radical contingency. And it is specifically for lesbian women, for self-identified lesbian women. And there was a group that showed up with uh, rainbow flags with the Star of David on it, right? So these are uh, people who are saying, I am here as a Jewish lesbian woman, and I would like to participate because I see some sort of uh, intersectionality between my Judaism and my lesbianism. Sure. And the Dyke March had uh, basically said, you are not welcome with this particular flag. Do not put a uh, Star of David onto a rainbow flag. And their justification for it is that 
in their opinion, it is not a flag of uh, Jewish queerness. It is a flag of Israel with a rainbow on it, right? And so the the Dyke March's position is we do not allow any, They their word was nationalist symbols. And the organizer made an interesting point, which is that she said, well, I actually have a rainbow American flag at home, but I'm leaving it at home because I'm not supporting um, nationalism here. And in her, in her opinion, simply having a, a flag of, of a country is, is in itself an exercise in nationalism. So there was this debate, but it was probably about 10 minutes. And I uploaded raw footage of just beginning to end their conversation between these two sides of this Dyke March organizer saying, please don't bring those flags into our event. And these, uh, Jewish queer women who brought their flags saying, well, we don't see it as an Israeli flag. We see it as a Jewish queer flag. And so yeah, these people can disagree over yeah. what these symbols mean. People can have good faith uh, disagreements over what it means to sort of criticize Israel, criticize foreign policy and so forth versus being anti-Semitic. What does that mean? What do these symbols mean? What do these people mean? Uh, who are they? Right. Yeah, I, um, I think I think the most speech and the most video and the most documentation is valuable to figuring out those questions. And I think mm. just taking that stuff down is not the solution. Yeah, it seems. um there seems to be a disingenuousness to people, though, of, of any group that, uh, say, the Women's March that took place a couple of years ago, where uh, I personally had uh, friends who were pro-life women who were going to be a part of the march and were disinvited to that march because of their their stance. So they're, they're, it's a group that's claiming to um, represent all women and all women's um, points of view and, and that, you know, to be inclusive of all women and their points of view. And yet, because of, of one point of view that they don't, they find distasteful, then they will be excluded. And so I guess I, I, I have a problem with the way it's presented. If you presented it as this is a, a progressive women's march, okay, mm -hmm. you know, you would know sort of what, what to expect, but it seems like a lot of these groups just claim that they are representative of the whole community, like the gay community or the, um, the, the women's community, whatever community that is, but then also want to marginalize people who don't fall in lockstep with them. Um, and I guess this is sort of off of the journalism topic, but, uh, I, I think, I think, Fairer journalism could play a huge part in bringing the rhetoric down and making people be a little bit more self-aware and um, maybe a little bit less uh, heated in their rhetoric. Well, yeah, I mean, so it's part of why I go out and I, I especially like covering people who don't necessarily uh, fit what the media stereotype of different uh, issues is. So, you know, for example, covering leftists with guns is something that I know that mm -hmm. CNN uh, surely <laughs> could do and they right. won't do it because they because they really profit off of the belief that that, you know, gun ownership is a conservative issue. And if you're not conservative, you have to be anti gun. Right. Like so they, they kind of make it simple like that. Uh, to the same end, you know, it was interesting talking to people at, for example, the March for Our Lives was probably the biggest uh, anti gun event that's happened in a while. And I uh, talked to a lot of people there who had some kind of, I guess you could say minority opinion. So I filmed a militia group that showed up there and that video got about half a million views of a militia wow. group that was trying to have conversations with people. Uh, and I also interviewed people who said that they were they are hunters and they're in favor of gun control. People who were saying, you know, I'm a gun owner, but. And, uh, you know, whether you agree with that position or not, uh, you know, I think that that's an interesting voice to have there. Uh, I think it's fascinating, actually, for example, this, uh, this isn't talked about very much, but uh, David Hogg, who led the March for Our Lives, his dad was an FBI agent. And uh, so he had he had guns in the house. David Hogg grew up cleaning his dad's gun. Right. I mean, so <laughs> these yeah. like uh, these political and the, again, it's not an endorsement of him. It's that's not me saying, therefore, David Hogg is reasonable and you right. should believe everything he says. But um you know, they, they, these groups just go at each other and the mainstream media cheers them on doing it. Yeah. I, um, you think it's uh, to me, it seems like that the reason that is for one, people are not one dimensional. Uh, and, and, you know, we 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 it's easier for us to put people in a box that's one dimensional and say they are X. So they believe this. But uh, people are not. And then also that. The media, not only the media, but politicians profit off of the fear-driven 
industry that ha has become media, that it's not reporting like, like you're doing. You're trying to find people who may have a differing opinion, one that would challenge the other side in their uh, stereotypical belief of what these people are or who is involved in this. And yet they don't because of the fear that helps control the masses. Um, yep. And so, and, and keep political parties, the Democrats and the Republican in power, because I think, like, I think Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were the best things that ever happened. Hillary to the Republicans and Donald uh, to the, to the uh, Democrats, because it's given them really a, a singular point to rally around, to rally their troops. And it's really sort of a false, it's, it's political theater. <laughs> it seems All to politics me. is theater, isn't it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, on your point about assumptions about political beliefs, I'll actually, uh, I'll reference my own mom, actually, uh, once watched one of my videos where I, I documented a neo-Nazi group and, um, you know, Nazis, nationals, you know, these were, uh, the group was called the National Socialist Movement. And they were talking about their support of, you know, national socialist unions. And so that, right, so I mean, they are all of the things that Nazis are, but I mean, they, but among those things, they are socialists. And my mom was surprised by that. She's like, I, I assumed that American Nazis would be capitalists. And I was like, <laughs> nope, Nazis are Nazis. Yeah. Nazis are Nazis are Nazis. Um, yeah. And, and again, you know, the, my, my point in saying that is that people might not really believe or, or sorry, not believe, uh, people might not understand the roots of these different groups sure. and what their ideologies are. And I think that it's part of the problem, uh, that has led to some of our divisiveness and to some of the impreciseness in the language of, sure. um, of, of po politicians who, who, uh, tend not to understand the issues that they're actually talking about. I think, for example, I'll say that, you know, I covered Charlottesville and I think Donald Trump was entirely unprepared to for that situation. I don't think he had really a clue um, what he sort of what he was talking about when he first reacted to it. Uh, and and that makes sense. He reacted to it really fast. Um, and I, that largely might be because he just watched yeah. the cable news. Right. Right. I when I got, you know, still with still wearing my bulletproof vest when I got to the, the hotel in Charlottesville after the day of, of uh, violence where I watched a young woman die. Um, I, when I turn on like the news and watch it, I mean, it could have been a completely different event. It just didn't well summarize what I had seen out there. And that's not to say that they were lying about it. It's just to say that they were so drastically oversimplifying the tactical and uh, political and sort of combat uh, nature of what had been going on. Mm. Do, you, do you think some of these reactions, even uh, by politicians or companies even, they often now, as soon as something happens before even the facts are settled, they're already coming out. We don't support this. We don't support that. You know, and, and we're going to get, like, say, the Roseanne situation, which, I mean, what a mess that was. But but it seemed like there was this big reaction and people, sponsorships being pulled and things like that before there was any real settling of what had happened. And may, maybe that's not the best um, scenario, but, but there have been others. And do you think that sort of um, is also a fear of being called like labeled racist, labeled a Nazi? Because those things are used so frequently now, those terms that they've sort of lost their real meaning. And and like you said, your mom would think, well, they would be capitalists when that's, you know, if you understand that it's a socialist movement, that that that's not mm -hmm. really in line with that. It would be less likely for that to be the case. So I, I wonder if that's part of part of that. So, I mean, so first of all, one thing that I talk about often is that um, I always only use the exact label that describes the person because labels have specific meanings. So I, I do use the term Nazi, but I only use it referring to people who who basically <laughs> who actually self-identify as Nazis or in some cases, uh, I, w I won't name specific names, but I referred to someone, for example, fairly recently as a neo-Nazi on Twitter, he showed up to New York wearing a swastika on his neck and like, a, um, you know, like the sort of fascist eagle like flag type thing and got into a confrontation with some like anti-fascist people or what have you. And, you know, and he and then he was uh, bothered by the fact that I had used the term neo-Nazi. Like, <laughs> so SWAT, if, if the person is wearing a swastika, if the person is yeah. alluding to Hitler and so on, 
you know, if, or if they are proclaiming national socialist ideology, then I refer to them as a Nazi. Mm. I don't refer, for example, to to if somebody is basically an ardent racist, but they are a uh, capitalist, then what what is their thing? They might be a white supremacist. Sure. If their specific belief is the separating of people, the establishment of an ethno state, then I would refer to them as a white nationalist. Um, I don't use terms that aren't what people are. And again, I th I think people people muddy those terms up uh, by throwing them around in different directions. And um, so it's it's important to be pretty precise or to be vague when you cannot be uh, precise. I and back to you you and this this whole thing that has we've been talking about that's gotten your your uh, YouTube channel demonetized. Right. Um are they going to fix that? <laughs> are they going to cuz I know like um Crowder he got demonetized but then remonetized but he has millions of followers. Um and I, I'm not sure what your follower count is. Uh you as a an honest like actually caring about journalism type person probably don't have quite as many because people generally <laughs> enjoy mental ascent and circle jerking their opinions. So, <laughs> you know, that that's kind of the thing, uh, which, you know, whatever, but, but uh, I, I'm just wondering if you, if you're going to get enough recognition for them to actually re-monetize. For them to do something. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so firstly, I, I would point out that it, in my opinion, it was a huge, error to do what they did to me and Crowder at the same time. Uh, I'm not specifically saying that they should have taken one action or another on Crowder, but uh, him and I are completely different, right? Um, yeah. And that's not a comment on his or my politics, but he does not purport to be a journalist. Right. He purports, he calls himself a comedian. You could call him a comedian or a commentator or what have you, but he he's a political uh He's a person who explores politics <laughs> with his personality, right? I I am a journalist who goes out and films things, and you will find very little of my voice in my channel. I sometimes upload videos when I make appearances on other people's news outlets. You sometimes hear my voice if I'm asking someone a question. But basically, when I'm covering something, you don't see me in, in it. Um, to that end, uh, so YouTube is... Crowder has made a very important point, and it's a true one, which is that he actually is not really hurt that much. He's been, he has the Streisand effect, which is that uh, YouTube trying to shut him down is causing more right. people to watch him talk about it. Uh, he was already like 70 to 90 percent demonetized anyway, um, so it didn't take away that much. And frankly, he makes his living selling mugs and T-shirts and right. stuff. I think, his, I think his actual fundraising thing is called Mug Club, right? Moitin so. Right. It's merchandising. So I could set up news to share T-shirts, I suppose. But, uh, you know, but I, that's not what I do. I have a Patreon that people can uh, subscribe on and I would love for them to do so, uh, especially now that YouTube took away one of the sources of income. But but ad revenue made a much bigger difference to me than it did to him on on relative on a relative scale. Um. And he's also pointed out, and he's right about this, that smaller content creators are the ones that can't actually get responses from YouTube. He, while he was live streaming, he had his lawyer like on the phone and like emailing back and forth with YouTube. I can't afford to hire a lawyer, right, to, to do this stuff. And and YouTube, not only have they not reached back to me, but even Forbes, Rolling Stone, and ABC reported on, and Washington Examiner reported specifically on me and asked YouTube for comment about me, and they didn't even respond to that. So uh, honestly, I, I really hope that YouTube re-explores this and I'm, I'm trying to poke them in the eye by doing all these media appearances where I explain how they screwed up uh, to pressure them or corner them into fixing it. Uh, but it's like, it's almost like that line in like Anchorman, I'm not even mad, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed that they've gone through six days of controversy without doing a single goddamn thing about it. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's amazing to me because it seems that for anyone, uh, like I, I really would describe it. It seems to me a misophobia, like this real actual fear of hate and, and that somehow it's an infectious, uh, thing that if you hear someone speak, like, like, uh, there was one of your videos that was taken down. That was, mm -hmm. um, an argument between a man. I don't know what his, he was a, he was some kind of white nationalist or, it was a Holocaust denier. A hol yes, a Holocaust denier and someone else. And they took that down, even though it's not even as if he didn't have rebuttal 
in that right. in that video. And I mean, the guy. Look, most people are not going to believe that. Like it's it's a it's a kind of a crazy point of view. And to just hear that doesn't mean I, I guess that it, they just assume that people are too stupid to sort it out for themselves. That if they hear one guy talk about this, all of a sudden they're infected. It it seems to be well. It yeah. So I I film almost exclusively events that take place in public uh, because I realize that it grants the opportunity for people to counter demonstrate it. If someone throws a milkshake at someone who I'm filming, then we will have the footage of that. If someone screams at them, you know, screw you, you racist, you know, whatever or something, then then we will have that. So, yeah, in that particular case, one of the two videos that they took down amidst the Vox adpocalypse it was, uh, I was at APAC, the American Israel political, uh, conference, and there was a pro Palestine protest, which is actually the main reason I was there to film this, uh, group of people saying, you know, these, uh, people are describing this American Israeli relationship. And here's why we find that relationship to be toxic to the rights of, um, Palestinian people. And so they arrived at APAC and the, uh, pro Israel people came out from APAC and started uh, sort of arguing with them kind of across a police line. And in some cases they kind of got to each other and we were able to talk. And I, I, if I recall, I, I don't believe there was even a single act of violence. Actually, I think I, it was probably what you might refer to as like the sheerest exercise in democracy, right. Of all of these different people, uh, even the Westboro Baptist church showed up and they were kind of condemning everyone. They're like, Oh, we don't yeah. like mu we hate Muslims or Jews. They're like, <laughs> neither of those are really, uh, yeah. They're like, all of you are going to burn in hell on both sides. Right. That's, that's Westboro Baptist church of church's version of like the many sides, many right. sides. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but then shows up a character <laughs> there then shows up an individual who is showing up to specifically, proclaim the idea that Israel is like a result of of the Holocaust that in his mind was invented. Uh, I let me state for the record that he is wrong. Right. Um, you know, my and by the way, my footage has it, literally if you go to Best Buy right now and buy the film Schindler's List on DVD, my footage is in that DVD in the special features. Um, so uh, this person who is spouting, um, you know, uh, essentially lies about history or claiming that history was a lie, uh, was actually counter protested or, or argued with by both sides. The Israel people and the Palestine people were both like, wait, what? And <laughs> what? Remember that guy <laughs> right. and start and both came together, starting to argue with that guy. And so my video documentation of Pete of two people, um, confronting a Holocaust denier is not the same as content that denies the Holocaust. Right. And YouTube seems not to or claims not to understand that distinction. And I largely suspect that it's a error as a result of them rushing a rollout. I think that YouTube has always generally been going in this direction, but they pretty clearly uh, announced and caused this adpocalypse in the wake of controversy over uh, uh, Maza feeling that he was being bullied by Crowder. And so I think YouTube probably rushed to roll out this new policy and be able to have uh, several channels to be kind of the lamb to the slaughter uh, to to demonstrate that they are widening their policies and that it's applying to people other than just Crowder. And they seem to believe that I was in violation of those new policies for having documented people arguing with a Holocaust denier. So what can we do to help you? What can people do? Because I, I know, um, like I said, I, I respect your work a lot and you personally greatly because you are so fair and you 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 do even here, you know, you try to make sure that you're you're being as fair as possible and, and as honest as possible about the things you're saying. And so um, how can how can people like us help help you? do this yeah. uh, besides joining your Patreon, which is a good idea. People should do yes. that. So there is the Patreon, <laughs> patreon.com slash Ford Fisher. Uh, as I've kind of explained to the, to the media in general, right. My bottom line was basically ads and Patreon. And I also managed to license my footage to films such as I've, you know, my footage of these types of people has been used in a film that won an Academy award and it has been used in a film that won an Emmy. So, I mean, this is important work. Uh, but those licensing fees are very sporadic, right? So Patreon really helps me create a uh, bottom line. Um, additionally, though, uh, especially if you, you know, and talk out about it anywhere on social media, but especially if you have Twitter, 
uh, tweet at Team YouTube, not just YouTube, but there's a, there's a handle called at Team YouTube and tag me at Ford Fisher, F-O-R-D-F-I-S-C-H-E-R. And tell them to re reinstate the full ad privileges of Ford Fisher's YouTube channel, uh, which is called News to Share. If you could include it in your show notes or whatever sure, uh, for your audience to see, uh, you know, all all those links, Team YouTube, me, and then the the channel itself. Um, and what you should tell YouTube, the important thing that I think YouTube messed up, I think they just got wrong because they rushed. They did not realize this is a channel that is for news and history and documentary purposes, and it is meant for the sake of people being able to criticize and analyze the work. The news doesn't stop at the raw footage. It's out there so that people can interact with it, can perform commentary on it, and every mainstream media outlet uh, does so. The exact footage, the, uh, the, one, the one other video that they took down was literally used in a documentary that I associate produced on PBS, right? If PBS can post it, uh, so should I be able to, yeah. and and I should be able to monetize it, and because this is this is my job, it's to document these things right. because I want them to be useful, and and they clearly are. And to to bring up 1984, which I, is a <laughs> book I personally love, and and you know one of the things that they did in in that uh, story is that they would go back and, and change history by changing the, the words used, cutting out words from the language. And I think that's a really important thing that people should really consider who may be on the, you know, censor everything we don't like side is that you, you give people, um, you don't give people a way to talk about these things and you take away their way of thinking about uh, things language really does affect how we're able to communicate to one another, and you're not actually making things better when you give people fewer words. They go to their hands and fists, um, and that's that's something that we see in children because they have very few words to describe how they're feeling or what's happening. They often will physically act out. So you're actually, I think it's it's self defeating and creates more violence than less. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's one of the things that people should really kind of consider in this, that we we don't, do we really want to have the kind of society where people can't even say a certain word, even in just, you know, a quote, quoting of someone else to talk about it, they couldn't say a certain word because that word is considered offensive and not the content of what the person is trying to get across. Right. I mean, I the the way that I would describe it is that one of YouTube's recent community standards that seems to be added is that uh, denial of history, um, is, and they mean Holocaust denial, but, but, but subjects other than that, you know, so claiming that events are, uh, false flags claiming, you know, basically generally speaking, denying that tragedies occurred is one of their new content issues. And the contradiction that I see with that is I am actually going out and trying to document the things that lead to tragedies and those, and the tragedies themselves, such as filming Charlottesville and, uh, you know, unfortunately, somebody dying, which, by the way, Heather Hare's mother tweeted out in support of me amidst this. Um, uh, she actually wrote that uh, basically what I do is journalism and it is in the service of democracy, um, which was a sort of endorsement that really means a, a ton to me sure. um, uh, to hear from her because she she's probably the person the most affected by these subjects that I try to cover and sh sort of she realizes the the value of it. Um YouTube, by taking down footage of those things, is in a way denying that same history and documentation. Right. There will come a day when people look back, right? The, the year 2119 will happen someday. A hundred years from now, people will look back at this political moment and there will be things that they want to learn from it, right? There will be historians who look back at this stuff. Hopefully. <laughs> and my assuming that we don't all die in some kind of a nuclear war. Yes. Um, the yes, the humans or robots of the future will want to analyze uh, the political moment of today and taking down footage of mine is 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 causing them to. Uh, uh, ba it's basically a, a, a preemptive, you know, denial of, of the issues that are taking place here. They're holistically saying, you know, we're, we don't want certain types of history being recorded, uh, as it happens. Yeah. I, speaking of robots, uh, speaking of robots. <laughs> yeah, I know. My um, favorite segue. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you and I both have an interest in transhumanism. Um, I think you're mm -hmm. much more learned on it than I am. I have, uh, 
mostly um, like my favorite movie is Blade Runner, and and I I used to love. Um, uh, certain science fiction when I was a kid that involved uh, artificial intelligence and transhumanism yes. and things. So um, you actually have been making a documentary for some time now on transhumanism. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that and, and what you're doing with it? Sure. And I just want to point out, you should definitely, if you, I just watched the movie I Am Mother on Netflix yesterday, right? I heard uh, about it. You should you should definitely watch that, okay. right? If you're interested in you you and also you the viewers, right? <laughs> Anybody uh, you know watching this who's interested in the sorts of subjects that we're about to breach, uh, definitely watch that movie. But um, so yeah, I am doing a documentary on the transhumanist movement. I started that a couple of years ago, and um, it is moving a little bit slowly. It was a little bit more in the news at. Uh, at the time, it it was a sort of hip subject that a lot of people were talking about. And um, at this point, I'm basically waiting on the results of certain experiments. I've I've filmed the beginnings of certain um, sort of uh, biohacking experiments that people have done, and we are awaiting the results of them to find out if they actually worked or not. And so in the meantime, I haven't been able to film a whole lot pertaining to it in a while. Um, but basically, to, to put it simply, the transhumanist movement is a movement of people who believes in evolving the human body using technology. And so they uh, generally break that up into uh, sort of three different kind of wings. There's um, super longevity is like the idea of using technology to live longer. So just as a very simple argument that a transhumanist would make, they would say, for example, that if you were to uh, replace your human heart with a fully functioning and never failing electronic heart, that you just have to recharge, or maybe it charges because you eat food or whatever. Um, you know, uh, most people die in the end, right? People don't die, quote unquote, of old age. Most of them die because their heart fails because they're old. Uh, if you had a heart that was never going to fail, uh, you'd probably increase uh, lifespan on average by like 10 years, right? And um, so, uh, and there are, there are other things that you could point out, right? Different other parts of the body you could replace. You know, of course, the question is, at what point is the thing no longer human? Um, I mean, in the total extreme, you could immortalize yourself by digitizing your mind, right, by taking a, a copy of your mind and putting it onto a computer. But is that really you? Uh, or is it a copy of you uh, or a copy of you that thinks it's you? Right. Uh, these are complicated subjects that, you know, we could talk yeah. about for hours. Yeah. Uh, so that's one out of three. There's um, there's the idea of. Uh, super uh, well-being, like the idea of basically increasing the functionality of somebody's body, um, which would be to use technology such as prosthetics and such, uh, or DNA editing to increase the function of the human body uh, in some way beyond whatever is uh, kind of normal or uh, to nature. So for example, I interviewed uh, a woman who actually has a chip in her body that vibrates based on the seismic activity of Earth. <laughs> um, so when an earthquake goes on somewhere in the world and it happens once every seven minutes or so, uh, there is a vibration in her body, um, that, that, uh, detects it and the vibration changes relative to the extremeness of the seismic activity. Uh, and so she does an interesting kind of performance that she, where she puts like soil on the ground and she like dances to the, uh, whatever the seismic activity of the earth is in that moment. And like, you know, she does it for about a half hour. And like, if not, if there happens to be none, then she'll just stand there still. Um, you know, uh, so very fascinating. I've also filmed an individual who, um, he goes by the name Iborg, uh, because when he was a child, he accidentally, um, the recoil of a shotgun, uh, 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 took out one of his eyes. And so he now has a, uh, electronic false eye that films out of the eyeball. So, uh, like in my interview with him, I have the three, you know, traditional camera angle setup, but I also actually have it synchronized to his angle of me out of his eyeball, Wow, um, which I think is very cool. Pretty incredible. Um, and then there's the idea of, of, uh, altering somebody's mind using technology, right? So, uh, a simple and more theoretical example would be, um, would it be possible, for example, to cure Alzheimer's? And this is a real technology that's being sort of worked on or theorized about. Could you cure Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's essentially happens because people, you know, sort of are losing their memories or they're losing access to their memories momentarily or permanently. 
if you could actually have a digital device like a hard drive or a flash drive or just sort of some kind of tiny micro version of that, and you could stick it in someone's brain and they were able to access the memories on it, um, then if the if the electronic device is making sure that the memories don't vanish, then the person would theoretically have access to the memories the whole time. Ergo, they wouldn't have Alzheimer's anymore, right? Uh, so so that kind of thing, uh, or even I mean, the highly theoretical and uh, you know, at this point in time, we might call it ridiculous, but who knows someday, right? I mean, maybe you don't have to go to school because you just download all the intelligence into your brain, right? Can't you, wouldn't it be nice to just install the dictionary? Like right, in the Matrix, I know kung fu, like. <laughs> Right, yes, amazing. right, yes. I would like to know kung fu, and you just sort of download uh, kung fu into your yes. into your brain. It creates all kinds of very fascinating issues, which I could talk about forever. But just as a very simple one to like leave people with on it, um, uh, you know how there's kind of the four quadrants. We think that usually libertarians are more acutely aware of this, but like the political quadrants, right? There's sort of the, this idea of like authoritarian left, uh, which is like communists. Sure. There's like the libertarian left, which is like you know. Uh, someone who's anti-state but anti-private property. There's the libertarian right, which is what we think of as kind of American libertarianism, private property, minimal go minimal or no government. And then there's kind of the authoritarian right, which you might think of as uh, you could say that it's Republicans or you could say that it's, you know, uh, fascists and so forth. Um, uh, within the transhumanist spectrum, there's kind of a four quadrant political spectrum you could think of as well. So the the equivalent of the libertarian right you would call a libertarian transhumanist. And that's someone who basically believes in applying the non-aggression principle to uh, uh, cyborgism, right? I have the right to alter my body however I want, and I also don't have the right to alter other people's bodies without their permission. Uh, you could have what the equivalent of the left, uh, left wing but pro-transhumanism would be called a techno-progressive, right? That would be sort of Bernie Sanders transhumanism, someone who <laughs> believes in... Uh, we should have transhumanism. We should have these new technologies, but we need to make sure that they are uh, sort of socially available. It can't just be for the rich that we edit genes to make someone more fit. It can't just be for the rich that, uh, you know, you have the availability of high functioning prosthetics and so on. Um, you then have uh, the equivalent of the authoritarian right, you might say, is would be what you'd call a right wing uh, bioconservative. A right-wing bioconservative would be someone who opposes these technologies on uh, the grounds that they are unnatural, that they are repugnant to God or something like that, right? So this is people who, you know, when you talk to them, they would say something like, you know, well, I don't want to have a, a number in my – under my skin like a, a microchip because it's it's the mark, mark of, of the, the beast. beast. <laughs> like that, right? The political ideology that actually exists, and I have uh, talked to some people who breach this uh, point of view, and I think people might not – uh, think of is what is sort of classified as left-wing bioconservatism. And a left-wing bioconservative is someone who basically opposes these things because they believe that they will exacerbate uh, sexism, classism, and racism. Um, if you believe that basically, you know, Elon Musk is going to get first access and he's going to give it to his rich friends who can pay uh, a bunch of money for it, right? If immortality is something that is uh, wildly expensive, uh, right? Or if, if uh, you know, amplifying your body without doing any exercise is wildly expensive uh, or, or injecting intelligence into your head is more expensive, right? Then you end up with this greater class division. Uh, you know, you have these super rich and physically superior people versus people who can't afford the things that are uh, making them, um, I think, you know, physically superior and therefore the, the, the gap uh, yeah. divides because you would assume that that having those amplifications would also make somebody more capable of generating financial resources. So a left wing bioconservative opposes all transhumanism on the basis of class inequality. I think uh, what you're speaking of right there it was covered pretty well in the movie Gattaca, I think is what it was yes. called from years yes. ago. And, and, you know, that there's this class of people that because their parents can pay for, you know, genetic modification when they're in utero that now there's you're a subclass of person if you don't get that that your parents have basically handicapped you uh in a way that really challenges you ever getting ahead in life um and so mm -hmm. it was a really interesting i i love the philosophical uh questions that these things bring up and and uh, another show that recently um i just loved and uh the second season will be coming out is altered carbon and it sort of uh -huh. has that same sort of 
what if, you know, it's a higher class of like class, you know, the, the more wealthy can afford these bodies and live, you know, in perpetuity. And um, then you have other people who are just gone and die and all these different things that the state can do uh, also with people's consciousnesses. Um, there's a, a scene in there that was really, really terrible. This, this young girl was um, put in prison and her body was no longer available when she came out, I think it was prison and, and they put her into an older woman who was way old. She was like a, a young girl and she was put into this old woman's body and the kinds of things that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fantasy at this point, but you, you have to wonder like, uh, what is it? Arthur C. Clarke said that, um, that any, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And, and so you start yes, to think right. about what we have now, like, you know, I have this, the world at my fingertips, literally so much information, um, more information than I can ever do anything with in my phone. And my, my great grandparents would have just been, even my grandparents, you know, amazed by this. It's almost like magic. So I think there's so mm -hmm. many great things that, 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 um, I don't know if it's a philosophy, but, but that transhumanism poses that are really, really interesting, uh, and have been being written about it. You have the Borg Cylons, um, uh, Isaac Asimov, I used to read like his foundation trilogy when I was younger and mm -hmm. it, it deals a lot with, you know, those kinds of things. So I, I find that really fascinating. How, how close are you? You think, I know maybe you don't really know I, being done. I have your... basically filmed everything. I think that I intend to, with the exception of a few specific people and, and things that I, that haven't happened yet that I anticipate happening that I have to be able to film to include them in it. Um, I, I generally speaking, I guess I'd say I'm 90 percent done filming what I will probably film, but I haven't I haven't edited it beyond a uh, version, a very early and rough version that I made for television a couple of years ago um, that that uh, I sold the rights to that exact copy to one particular news outlet that actually didn't air it. But uh, that's what happens yeah, <laughs> when you right. get into yeah. challenging subjects. Yeah. So, so. Uh, that's great. I, I certainly look forward to that coming out. And uh, I, I really like um, just thinking about those possibilities. And, you know, everything has consequences. And as, as you know, um, libertarians, myself included, are often can, you know, called utopianists. And, and people think we believe in this world where people will just be happy and treat each other nice and and that's just not the case that, that I believe in a real world scenario. And I know suffering mm -hmm. isn't ended by any kind of uh, state or non-state that that's not going to end all human suffering. But uh, I just want people to have the most opportunity and uh, to live their life the way they see fit. And so I think human uh, transhumanism often is scary for people in that way. And they they feel like, you know, we're just going to be replaced by robots or, or something mm -hmm. like that, or people aren't going to be people anymore. We're going to have Darth Vader walking around everywhere. That's more machine than human. I know? think that sounds awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. No, uh, <laughs> It's always uh, portrayed as something kind of scary in most, most science. I mean, yeah. So I think that sci-fi is good as a, uh, way of looking at what sorts of problems might we experience. I think it actually represents kind of the ethos of our anxieties about these issues. And I think that that's generally a good thing. I think it's something that actually is uh, probably a positive. One one small criticism I have of my favorite genre, really, which is like sci-fi and horror stuff, is that most films that address the issue of transhumanism uh, tend to... Um, uh, then make the, you know, make them fight, right? <laughs> like, uh, I even saw, like, there was a trailer yesterday for a video game that looks like it's basically about transhumanism, um, you know, that was released at E3 that Kyanu Reeves is going to, like, be starring oh, yeah. in. And, uh, you know, and of course, but, like, it's like he's got this, like, chip in his body and he's, like, going to deliver it to people, you know, and th but then they get into, like, a shootout. Like, every <laughs> you know... I would say that one of the best movies of like the last 10 years in the genre is I really appreciated Walking Phoenix's movie, uh, Her, Her, because that film addressed like that was like really a transhumanist issue of, of a person falling in love with a computer. Um, but it was not a movie that preoccupies its sort of robot human relations with like what would happen if they shot each other. Right. Right. I think that that movie actually. Not the Terminator. Some... <laughs> yeah. Right. And Terminator is wonderful. And I love the issues yeah. that Terminator has. Right. I mean, Terminator is really the origin of like the term cyborg in modern use. Right. Um, so Terminator is awesome. I love it. 
But uh, I actually I would endorse her as a great movie that um, that I think breaches those subjects in a way that isn't so based on sort of uh, violent. I don't I don't right. I don't think that really anything can come into society that will cause us to just like kill each other nonstop, like, in so, you know, like Terminator or so, you know, what have you. Uh, I think that the types of issues we'll deal with might actually look a whole lot more like her. Right. Humans are complicated and emotional. Yes. And I, I think, too, that. A lot of times, um, say a movie like RoboCop is a way of addressing yeah. police brutality in a way right. that takes it out of sort of out of the real world, but actually deals with real world issues. So it's a way to it's a device to use and to to talk about um, the actual police abuses that that go on and uh, you know things of, of that nature and how how people can can really. Um, have have an understanding of it and, and maybe break down the barrier to some people who would always defend the police no matter what as to, but wait mm -hmm. a second, um, let's make this person not actually the human that they were and so we can talk about the issue. And I, I think that's a really cool thing that science fiction can do and it, all storytelling mm -hmm. can really do. Fun fact that brings this really full circle. Uh, Joel Kinnaman, who was in Altered Carbon and he actually played as the RoboCop in the remake of RoboCop mm -hmm. actually has used my footage from YouTube uh, in a video of his where he is trying to get people to vote for a certain political party in Sweden. And I have oh, no wow. particular opinion about <laughs> uh, the, you know, the politics of Sweden and who you should vote for if you're Swedish. Uh, but Kinnaman approached me asking for that. Well, I mean, through a representative, but, uh, you know, asking for um, that uh, footage to be able to use that footage. And I and I let him do so. Um, but I think that it highlights the uh, fact that uh, that this content is worthwhile and YouTube made a mistake when uh, when RoboCop needs my content. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about that? That's a nice little wrap up. Uh, so because we have, you know, come to the end of our show here. Ford, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I know you're a busy guy and, and I really admire and appreciate your work. And uh, I would encourage everyone to support Ford and what he's doing because it is really important work that you're doing. And it's it's not the entertainment that a lot of people, you know, want and pay for. Um, but uh, I think as as radicals, if you want to say a, a broader group than even just anarchists or libertarians, um, that we should try and support people like you because that's really going to help us get more of what we want in the world. And, and it's really important mm -hmm. to put our money where our mouth is. So, uh, I, I really appreciate you being on the show and, uh, give us your Patreon one more time and any other yeah. websites that you, so it's patreon.com slash Ford Fisher, F O R D F I S C H E R, uh, news to share on Facebook. I'm at Ford Fisher on Twitter and it's news to share on YouTube. And I also have a minds account, which is sort of an anti-censorship social media, uh, alternative platform uh, where you can find me also at Ford Fisher. And like I said, uh, at the beginning or toward, I guess now toward the middle of this, um, uh, the thing I would recommend in addition to, you know, go like and subscribe all of those things and join Patreon if you can is uh, tweet at Team YouTube and uh, say, please, uh, you know, reinstate at Ford Fisher's uh, <laughs> YouTube account because he is a uh, news video creator, uh, and his content is meant for news and history, uh, you know, critical analysis purposes. Research. And, uh, and hopefully YouTube will understand the error that they made. And, uh, if you tag me in those tweets so that I see them, then I, then I will retweet them. <laughs> Thanks so much for it. I really appreciate it. And thank you viewers for, uh, and listeners for listening to the show today. And I hope that, um, you will tune in again and support this show as well. Uh, but really, if you are not familiar with Ford work, Ford's work, get familiar with it because I think um, you will be impressed as well as everyone who, who knows him is. So take care. Till next time. Peace.